Um, good morning, Bear Creek Church family. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bridget, and I'm a member here at Bear Creek. I serve on our missions team, and um, I'm also a Compassion International sponsor and advocate. Um, I personally have been sponsoring kids with compassion for the past 10 years or so. I have one child who I sponsored through completion of the program, and I currently have four other um, children that I'm currently sponsoring. For those of you who don't know, Compassion International is a holistic Christian ministry dedicated to lifting people out of poverty in Jesus' name. Um, they're best known as a child sponsorship program, um, and we as a church have done a lot of um, annual Compassion Sunday events. They do also do work with um, other aspects of ministry, including um, health care, leadership training, mother and children, um, wells, providing animals for um, income, and things like that. Um, this year, Compassion Sunday is a little bit different, obviously, since we're all um, in the pandemic. <laughs> um, usually we focus our event on child sponsorship, inviting members of the church to sponsor um, children. However, at this time, Compassion is not um, focusing on new child sponsorships because every, um, all of their efforts are going towards um, dealing with the COVID-19 virus um, across the world. Um, in general, a child living in poverty dies every five seconds. And that is without the pandemic that we have in place. Um, these children are dying from preventable causes. And now um, COVID-19 has impacted, um, impacted these rates. People in other countries, just like in the United States, are losing their jobs, losing their access to education, and losing their access to food. Um, Compassion says that the pandemic problem is that we have parents who are already struggling are now even less able to provide for their families. Um, if a family member is getting sick, they do not have access to the health care they need. They may not even be able to get tested, and they don't have the money to pay for the doctor, let alone any medicine that might be um, helpful to them. And parents are desperate for work, and they are losing their jobs and unable to pay rent and afford the basic necessities. So what Compassion is doing right now is focusing all its resources on um, providing the basic necessities for families um, in the countries that they serve in. So the Compassion Centers are providing um, food and or grocery vouchers for families who are currently in need and can no longer afford, afford food. Um, staff is helping family get access to medical care and to cover costs of treatment, which they normally wouldn't be able to. And they're also helping with rent and housing payments for families to be able to stay in their homes um, during this time. So our fundraising efforts this year, instead of focusing on child sponsorship, we would like to focus on um, the disaster relief provided for COVID-19. Um, Compassion, for every $80 donated, Compassion is able to provide family, a family of food for an entire month. Um, when that goes up to $110, they are able to add in nutritional supplements. When that goes up to $150, they're able to provide hygiene essentials. And when they reach $200, they're actually able to provide medical screening for COVID-19 to an entire family. So what we would like to do as a fundraising effort is uh, we would like to be able to help um, raise $1,000, which would be the monies needed for five families to provide food, nutritional supplements, hygiene essentials, and medical treatment for COVID-19. Um, our fundraising goal, like I said, is $1,000, and we're hoping to do that by June 1st. If you're interested in partnering with us to make this a reality, you can send your money to uh, make a donation online um, at our website, which is listed below on the screen. And just in the comments, list uh, Compassion International. And then you can also um, send in a check if that works better for you. But we're looking forward to putting our, um, 
our beliefs into action and continuing our sponsorship of Compassion International and meeting the needs of the global community. Good morning, church. I'm glad to be with you now and to uh, get the chance to um, sing worship with you all from all of our different corners. So I hope that um, this week has uh, been a blessed one for you all in, in different ways. Even if the blessings look different than what we could have expected, I hope that um, this past week and we, I pray that this week going forward that we'll get to recognize those blessings and that we'll get to um, notice God's presence with us uh, day by day and moment by moment in all the little things and the big things. So this, um, I guess this morning I'll just start off us off in prayer um, and we'll get, get to sing together then. Would you join me? Dear Father, we thank you for being with us this morning. We thank you that regardless of our circumstances, Lord, you promised your presence with us. You promised your fruit in, in our lives and in our hearts. You promised your direction for, for our lives, Lord. You promised your hope. You promised a good future, Lord. And so we look to you and we cling to you as our source of strength, our hope, our life. Lord, our fountain of love. We want to draw, draw from that spring today. Lord, we want to uh, swim in your blessings, Lord. We want to enjoy your presence. So would you come meet us this morning? In Jesus' name. So this first song is O Come to the Altar.
love that those last two lines of that song and um, the the benediction that that song uh, gives us at the end. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. In light of all this, in light of the wonderful Savior that he is, we can bear our cross and we are to tell the world of this treasure that we found. This next one will be familiar to, I think, many of you guys. It's uh, an oldie but a goodie, and I know that oldie is relative. So um, this is Blessed Be Your Name.
And God, we do pray that we can make that true, that we will bless your name when the sun's shining down on us, when the world's all as it should be, Lord, or when we're in the desert, <laughs> when we're in the wilderness, or when we're on the road marked with suffering, Lord. We want to bless your name. This last song is um, Wondrous Cross, based off of the hymn, When I Surveyed the Wonderful Cross. Oh, that the song is Wonderful Cross, the hymn is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
With that, I want to um, close with just some verses here. As the beginning of that song, um, it can beckons us to survey the wondrous cross. These verses here call us to fix our eyes on Jesus and what is not seen, but what is unseen. So this is 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Glad to worship with you, church. I'll turn it over to Pastor Aaron. Good morning, Bear Creek Church. Thanks for joining us today for our Sunday worship uh, time together. Hope you're doing okay. Um, sounds like the stay-at-home order is going to be lifted a little bit, so we might have a, a little more time to get out a little bit, but be careful. Uh, the virus is still there, and we got to be careful about that, but it's nice to kind of loosen up a little bit, and especially when the weather is getting a lot nicer. It's going to be 80 degrees this week, and uh, which is going to be fantastic to be a part of that. Well, I kind of like 72 degrees and no humidity, but we'll take the warm weather. But I hope, hope that you're doing well, and uh, hope that you continue to push forward as we deal with this pandemic in our life. Just a few announcements I wanted to ask or to let you know about. Uh, we are collecting food for some of the homeless families that are in our community that are staying in hotels at this time. There's been a shortage for them. Some of them can't get out, and so and Melissa Brandt, who you heard from last week, asked if we could help with that, and we'd be glad to do so. And I know that some of the food's been coming in, and so you're welcome to bring that in. It needs to be canned, um, no pork, uh, but just foods that families can open up in a hotel room and put in a, a microwave oven and, and have a good meal to get, uh, together with their family. Um, we also are... Um, have a lot of stuff happening on campus to come on out and drive through. Uh, there's some siding going on in one of the buildings and it's really, really looking good. And also if you're bored, <laughs> you can come out and help with some of the mowing. We have some twigs and things that need to be picked up around as well so that we can mow around the trees. And so you're welcome to come out and do some weeding and mowing and, and just get out and get some really good fresh air. And, uh, uh, but it's starting to green up and everything is looking great outside. We have some sad news to say. Uh, Mary and Ken Norrie have been part of our church for the last few years, and Mary's been battling a, immune, or a, a disease that has affected her lungs for the last few years, and she passed away on uh, Friday or on Saturday morning, early in the morning, very peacefully. And so our heartfelt uh, prayers go out to Ken and Mary's family, and uh, in the future we'll hear more about a, a memorial service. Again, we can't gather like we could normally, and so you'll hear more information about that. And so Mary and Ken came to us. I just love Mary. She she was had an insatiable desire to read and to grow and to study, and she just loved the Bible. And um, I've, I've given, her, given her a book, and she would just gobble that up, and she just wanted more. And so we really miss her, but we also rejoice with her because she's receiving her reward in heaven. We pray for Ken and encouragement for him as he loses his, his partner in life, and we pray for encouragement for him as well. So please pray for the Nori family and blessings on them. Also, one last thing, if you're not using the Right Now Media, please keep doing that. There's a lot of great resources on there that you can use to grow during this time period. And um, if you don't have access to that, you can go to our website at, at uh, bearchurch.org, and there's a link there that you can click on. You can sign up, and you can start using those resources. Again, really great resources on marriage and family and apologetics and Bible studies and and some fun things for kids there as well. And just another way to encourage you to continue to grow during this time that we're at home. Hope that you're doing all well. Hey, I wanna shout out to the seniors too. Congratulations on graduating next few weeks. And I know it's gonna be a weird graduation for you, but we're proud of you. And uh, just hang in there and congratulations on finishing your school year. What a unique year to remember. That's one thing that you, that you always remember, that unique year of, of 2020. All right. Last week we had some really dumb jokes, and evidently that went over good. So this week we're going to start some dumb jokes as well. These are all about sheep. Yeah, sheep. So what do you call a dancing sheep? A ballerina. Ballerina. Yep. Uh, what do you call 100 sheep rolling down 
a, a hill. It's a, it's a landslide. What, where do sheep watch funny videos? On you, YouTube. Uh, what kind of car does a sheep like to drive? A Lamborghini. What do you call a religious sheep? A Baptist. Uh, what do sheep wear on their hooves during the winter? Well, they wear wool muttons. Muttons. Where do sheep get their haircuts? At the Baba shop. Why did the sheep get a ticket on the freeway? Because she took an illegal U turn. What do you call a sheep with a machine gun? Lambo. Lambo. Yeah. What do you get when a sheep runs into a hostess snack? A ramalama ding dong. Who wrote these things? These are crazy. Lama ding dong. <laughs> All right. Why did why could the flock of sheep never remember anything? Well, they didn't have enough ram. That's for your computer geeks out there. Uh, what business do uh, what uh, what do business sheep read every day? The Wool Street Journal. Where do sheep go on vacation? The Bahamas. <laughs> Bahamas. Oh, I said that kind of wrong. All right. Uh, what did the deaf barber say to the sheep? I can't shear you. Uh, what animal is the most quiet on the farm? A sh sheep. What did the farmer say when the sheep threw up? Ew. What sorority did the sheep join at college? Lambda, lambda, lambda. And where, where do sheep buy office supplies? At stables. Where do they get their groceries? Well, at Walmart. Which washing machine brand do sheep always buy? Well, it's a wool pool. Okay, I know that was bad. That's really, really bad. In fact, let's see. Let's check in. Let's see what a sheep thinks about all those jokes. <coughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Well, we're going to be talking about sheep today. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're probably wondering what in the world did I just turn into. We're going to be talking about sheep. I know many of the states have started to relax some of the restrictions that were in place to bring down the infection curve for the COVID-19 virus. So they're lifting the, the stay-at-home orders. And some are really excited about that, opening up a little bit. Others are a little more cautious as well. They're still concerned about that, getting sick. And as one doctor says, it's not going to go away anytime soon. They're really expecting it to be around... For a year, two years, I heard somebody say five years, and um, who knows, I just heard on the radio coming this morning that five uh, Navy men that were on a ship that had it before just got it again. So they're still trying to figure out what's going on with all this stuff. <clears throat> so there's a little bit of uncertainty still, and there's some anxiety out there as well. Now, there's a lot of things that we cannot do. So we've been focusing on these last few weeks of what we can do in the middle of this pandemic, and how do we navigate this dark valley? Well, today I want to talk about one of the things that we can do, and what it is is I can relax, but there's a qualifier to that. It's easy to say that, I can relax, but I want us to focus in, I can relax in the Lord as we deal with this stuff in our life. This verse, this uh, passage might sound familiar to you, but let me read it for you. And it has something to do with sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's one of the most familiar, the most sung, the most studied, the most prayed, the most loved psalms in all the psalms. That's Psalms 23. And I'm sure that if you grew up in a church, that's one of the things that you've heard over and over, read at a variety of different situations. <clears throat> it's 
it's quoted by the soldier in battle, fearing injury and possible death, by a grieving widow standing by the grave of her loved one, wondering how she's going to go on from here, the guilty wanderer seeking forgiveness and direction, the lonely stranger longing for companionship and love, the orphan and the forgotten, the suffering saint strapped to a bed of pain, the depressed and the jobless, the prison inmate and the persecuted, the prodigal and divorced, all of them have focused on this psalm to help them find comfort and peace as they navigate the dark valleys of life. Few inner battles are more fierce than the daily battle of uncertainty. And we feel it right now going through the pandemic, still trying to figure out what we're going to do and how long this is going to last. Now, we've encountered one or more of its many facets, this idea of uncertainty, <clears throat> when we've struggled in our careers, our purpose and pain, job security, financial pressure, physical uh, handicaps, relational snags, and a dozen other confusing uh, puzzles that not quickly or easily solved. Now, David, the author of this psalm, knew what it was like to be under pressure. He was in line to be king. He was... Uh, King Saul was seeking his life continually because of his jealousy. He was constantly fighting military battles, and, in, and he had distress within his family. And so he knows uncertainty. And so he goes back to his roots, thinking of a time when he was tending his father's sheep, and how peaceful and tranquil it was compared to the frank the pace of life that he was living now. So we can learn so much from this psalm, and we can learn a lot about God, we can learn a lot about ourselves, and we can learn a lot about how to deal with the uncertainties of life. And so I thought this is a really good passage to take apart and look at, and hopefully to encourage you as we continue to fight this battle out there. We can learn how to relax in the Lord. Let me share with you seven reasons why. Well, you know, what do you think David used as shepherd? Now, of course, we don't live in that kind of culture really anymore. We have farmers, and, and we do used to have some people that raise sheep in our congregation as well. Um, but it's not, it's not our culture anymore. But back then, it was part of their culture. But a shepherd was typically one of the lowest jobs that you could have. The, re irres or, excuse me, the res responsibility typically went to the youngest person in the family. And it was a stinky, boring, lonely job being out there all by yourself trying to control those animals. And so why do you think David compared it to the Lord? Well, one of the reasons is that David was a shepherd, and so he had those kinds of experiences. Another reason was that in ancient Near Eastern writings and literature, uh, that compa uh, kings were compared to shepherds a on a regular basis. And so there's kind of a uh, royal language being used here when it's talking about shepherding. Now, just think of it as a shepherd compared to a king or compared to a deliverer or, or even compared to like the Bible will say that the, the Lord is my rock or the Lord is my refuge. But a shepherd, that's personal, that's intimate, that's relational. And so it's, kind of, kind of, it's got that kind of connotation to it. But a shepherd also, when you think about it, was meant to care for the sheep, to guide it, direct it, protect it, show it where it needs to feed, and to care for the sheep. And that was, that was the image of what their leaders, uh, what people long for in their leaders, a king that would shepherd them and guide them and protect them and love them and not look for their own self-interest. Man, we need to pass that on to our leaders today, don't we? On all sides, this idea of making sure that they're looking out for the best for us and not just for themselves. So David uses this image to portray God as a caretaker of his people, a God who provides and protects and leads to right pathways. So the emphasis is on my, it's, there's a personal relationship here that God not only is the shepherd of his people, but he's my shepherd and he wants to shepherd my life. So here's the question then, though, why sheep? Now I want you to note that when you read through that, it's mostly in the context of the sheep looking at the shepherd. <clears throat> and so it's from the viewpoint of a sheep. So why, what's the big deal about sheep? What do you know about sheep? Well, one thing is that they lack a sense of direction. They can easily get lost, even in familiar territory. They're also virtually defenseless. Have you ever been scared of a sheep? I mean, they don't have any claws. They don't have any, they're not very fast. They're not very nimble. I mean, they don't have a big, long roar. They just go, bah, you know, is that scary? That's not going to scare anybody like a lion roar. And so basically they're defenseless. They don't have any way to, to protect themselves. And they're awkward and they're weak and they're ignorant. They have spindly legs and tiny hooves and they're pitifully slow, even devoid of anything angry, like an angry growl. They're defenseless. A third is that sheep are easily frightened, being ignorant, unimpressive in stature, and very much aware of their weaknesses. Sheep find comfort only in their shepherd's presence. That's the only time that they feel comfortable when he's around to protect them. Sheep are by nature unclean. There's animals that lick themselves, rub them, rub them in trees or on the ground to clean themselves. Sheep don't do that. They rely on the shepherd to take care of them and to clean them. And sheep cannot find food or water. While most animals have a keen sense of smell, sheep uh, depend upon their shepherd completely to find food and water. 
If left themselves, sheep will eat poisonous weeds and die. And when one does it, the other one follows it. Isn't that crazy? They're not the smartest animals in the world. But doesn't that sound like like human beings? When we try to do life on our own and we mess up and, and do some crazy things that we know that we shouldn't, but yet we still do it? So David's point being is that we need to be totally reliant on God as a shepherd to guide us and direct us in life. And when we do, we have protection, we have guidance. There's a lot of things that come into our life. That's why he says in the first verse in Psalms 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. That could be translated, just adding a little bit, I do not lack any necessity in life. That's a great promise. But it comes because God is our shepherd. So what are those things? What are some things that we will not lack? And these are some of the reasons why that we can relax in the Lord. The first is that I will not lack peace. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Philip Keller was a pastor and an author, was a, a shepherd for eight years of his life. And he wrote a book about that called The Shepherd Looks at Psalms, or Psalms 23. It's a really fascinating read, giving you some details. A lot of details in this message today come out of that. So he writes that sheep do not lie down easily. In fact, it's almost impossible, he says, for them to be made to lie down unless four things are required, unless four things happen. First, because of their timidity, they refuse to lie down unless they are totally free of any kind of fear. Secondly, because of their social behavior within the flock, they will not lie down unless they are free from friction from other sheep. Third, if tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. Only when they are free of pests will they relax. I'm like that too. I need to get rid of mosquitoes before I can relax. And lastly, sheep will not lie down as long as they feel in need of food, that they're hungry. So they won't lie down if they're hungry. Isn't that interesting? So fear, friction, flies, and food keep them from lying down. They must be free from each of those in order to be comfortable. And so, as Keller notes, only the shepherd can provide the trust, the peace, deliverance, and pasture that is needed to free the sheep from them. So in our hectic, hurried, harassed age in which headache and stress <clears throat> medications have become huge money makers, we must occasionally be forced to lie down by our Savior, to slow down, to take on a healthier lifestyle, to cut back on the activities that we do. That's one thing that the pandemic has done for us. It's, it's forced us to cut back. And now we have a lot of time to reflect and think and maybe get some of the projects done. I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, no one's supposed to go out, but man, there's a lot of people at Menards looking for projects to do. It was just packed this week. Um, somebody suggested that we should, since we can't meet at church, we should meet at Menards where there's 500 people shopping. Good idea, Caleb Netterhoff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the point is that it's helped us kind of cut things out of our life. Sometimes the Lord forces us to lay down. Maybe this is what the pandemic is doing for us. It's forcing us to lay down and to reflect on life. <clears throat> the good news is that there's green grass there. Green grass, that was an image of <clears throat> having everything in life. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was an image of Near Easterners, you know, just being in a beautiful, comfortable, about peace and, and comfort and all those kinds of images. And it says that God will give us that. And quiet waters, sheep don't like to eat when water is rushing or moving. They like quiet waters. It scares them. So we trust in God and, in, 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 excuse me, in, in his way and in, in, in his life that he provides. When we do that, we're going to have peace. <clears throat> you know, I've been with people that have passed away. And I've sat with them when they've given their last breath. And some of the most impressive people that I've ever met are those that face death with, with courage and with peace. I've had conversations with them when they finally they made that decision. It was like a burden was released of them and they just focused in and they were ready to go. They were ready to go meet their maker. I can talk with one girl, probably in her mid-30s, just had a baby and found out she had stomach cancer and she had complications from surgery and finally she was just tired of it. And she called me into her room and had the other family leave and we had just a beautiful talk. And she says, Aaron, I'm ready. I'm ready to go see Jesus. And she just kind of had this smile on her face. We gave her a big hug and, and we prayed together. Man, that is powerful. And that's what the Lord can do for you. He can give you that peace. He makes us lie down in grief pastures, pastures and he leads us beside. He can give us peace. We will not lack peace. Secondly, I will not lack second chances. It says in verse three, the first part of that verse, he refreshes my soul. In Hebrew idiom, the word 
uh, refreshes my, or my soul, or it can be translated renews my life. It can mean to bring me to repentance and conversion. But since life is used, the metaphor here has a physical and psychological sense to it. Philip Keller explains this by the situation known as what they call cast sheep or uh, cast down sheep. What happens is this, and this is really fascinating. He writes, A heavy, fat, long fleece sheep will lie down comfortably in some little hollow or depression in the ground. It may roll on its side slightly to stretch out and relax, and suddenly the center of gravity in the body shifts so that it turns on its back far enough that the feet no longer touch the ground. It may feel a sense of panic and start to paw frantically, and frequently this only makes things worse. It rolls over even further, and now it's quite impossible for it to regain its feet. In this position, gases build up in the body, cutting off circulation to the legs, and often it is only a matter of a few hours before a sheep dies. Isn't that amazing? The only way to restore the sheep to health is if the shepherd can come in and turn him over. He comes in and gives him life. He refreshes his soul. He flips him. He changes. He, he helps him, gets his life in order. Isn't that interesting to me? I just thought that was fascinating. I think it's a beautiful picture of second chances. Do you think our culture is in a mob culture, isn't it? It feels like a mob culture. Everyone is quick to rush to judgment without even getting any information. If they just hear a, a tidbit of information, they go online, they go on Facebook, and they attack and they attack and they attack. And then they don't retract anything when they find out that it wasn't true. They keep the story going, <coughs> Excuse me. especially if they don't like that person. It's just phenomenal. And then if a person is guilty, they have to be guilty for life. That there's no grace there. They always bring it up. Even if that person has done good after good after good after doing that something, you know, 30 years ago, they bring it up like it's still the part of that person's life. Boy, I'm glad they didn't do that for all of us because we all be in trouble. We need second chances in life. And that's what this story is about. And that's what he's talking about. He refreshes my soul. He gives me a second chance when I stumble along the way. I am so glad that our God is a God of second chances and third chances and six chances. I think of... of Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son. You know, Billy Graham has preached to probably a billion people in his lifetime as he broadcast on radio and TV. A phenomenal uh, person that's impacted the, uh, the 1900s into the early 2000s. I remember watching him as a kid growing up and that distinct voice. And he was known for his character. He was known for uh, making sure financially that he never had a lot like some of the TG, or TV preachers had. So he was a person of character. And Franklin was one of his sons. And growing up as a PK, that's hard. But he really took off and became a rebel. He rebelled against his father, rebelled against God, and really kind of really broke loose. But the Lord captured his heart, and he came back and repented and gave his life back over to the Lord again. Now he's in charge of the Billy Graham Association, and he preaches himself, preaches uh, also around the world, not as much as his father did. Uh, but he also uh, started a a ministry called Samaritan's Purse that has helped poor people all over the world. Right now they have a Samaritan Purse hospital in the middle of Central Park in New York as they're working with COVID patients. But it's unbelievable how God changed Franklin's life. That's a God of second chances. And that can happen for you, to you. Look up here for a second. I know you're looking at my ugly mug. But if you're struggling, wondering if God would ever love you, that's absolutely... Uh, don't that God can't love you? That's not true. God loves you and he wants to forgive you. He's a God of second chances, no matter what you've done in your life. You might think that you've done something so horrible that nobody else has done. That's not true. Read the Bible. It's all been done there. God is a God of second chances and that will help you relax when you understand that. Third, I will not lack guidance. Three, uh, verse 3, the latter part of that verse. He guides me along the pat right paths for his namesake. Now, sheep are foolish creatures. In fact, they're probably the most unintelligent animal on the planet. One aspect of their senselessness is seen in the fact that they so easily wander away. They can have a good shepherd who have brought them back to the best grazing land and abundant land, and they will graze for a little bit, but they'll keep walking, and then they'll go into a, a desert or deserted area and start eating crazy plants. They're just not very smart. One, one uh, guy that used to um, uh, grow up on a farm with sheep says they'll look up into the sky and they can drown themselves in a heavy rain because they just keep staring like where this water is coming from. That they have to be shoved, shoved into a barn because that's how they're not very intelligent people or intelligent uh, animals. They're creatures of habit. They may be grazing a good land, like I said before, and then they'll move to another land where the fields are ruined. Or they'll overgraze it. They'll eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, and then it's all gone. They'll, they don't know when to stop. So 
No other class of livestock requires more handling than sheep, and therefore a shepherd will move them from field to field and protect and find them abundant supply of water and a safe place to stay. A, sh a shepherd will know the right path to take. And that's the image here. You know, we're sheep. We make those same kind of mistakes. And we need someone to guide us in their path. And it's a path of righteousness or right living. That the Lord will guide us and show us the way that we should live. The way that he created us to live. And notice it says that we are to do that in his namesake. <clears throat> that uh, when we follow him, when we step out and trust him in faith, it honors his name. It recognizes his character that God is faithful. And because God is faithful, I'm going to follow through because I know that God will come through. And so it's faith. That's what it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, he leads me along right past for his namesake, that we honor his character. I, you know, I'm amazed at how God has guided our church from the very beginning when we prayed asking what God wanted us to do and that we wanted to start a church for the poor and the poorly in our Rochester community and how he brought people together and guided people together with, with just interesting conversations that we had with other people and then how he hook, connected and, and, and hooked people up uh, and then how he guided us where our mission was supposed to go when he provided that first home that we fixed because of a contact or because of a prayer of, uh, of Jeff and Christy praying for that house and how Christy was uh, able to meet this person and find out that it was their house and so we were able to go and help. And then when working on the house, Chris Bailey came to, was out of a job and so he needed some work and so we hired him to come and help that house. He had eventually got a job at... Uh, at the Oak Terrace Trailer Park, and lo and behold, Lord, Lord led us over there, and, and Chris is the manager, and allow us to come in and do some fix-ups there. Um, it's just amazing how God has guided us, and how and the the direction that He's leading us, and it all comes from. And we truly do seek Him, and now we're on this campus, and. Uh, Getting, getting to know some wonderful people from all different backgrounds out here. And I know that he'll continue to guide us in the future as well because that's who he is. He's our great shepherd. Now he can do that for a church and he can do that in your life as well. If you let him, he will lead you on the right path. And when we step out and trust him, that brings honor to his name because it says, God, we believe that you're faithful. And so we're going to follow and that will help us relax when we know that God is guiding us. Number four, I will not lack courage. Even though I walk, it says in verse four, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now a shepherd needed to move their flock during the seasons and the shepherd would go ahead to make sure that they're going on a safe path, uh, make sure that there's not any wild animals in that area and to find some really good feeding places. Now there are hills and mountains and crevices and those were the dark places where animals could hide like snakes or, or uh, uh, bears or even bandits. And so the, these dark valleys that they would probably have to travel through were very dangerous. Uh, now some translations say, that darkest valley, they translate it into the shadow of death. And it very well could mean that's what the author is talking about, that the darkest valley is death. And we probably all know that. It's something that a lot of people fear. Something that we don't have to fear as a Christian following Jesus, but it's something that people fear, and that is dark. It's a cold, dark place. But he's also talking about dark valleys when we go through experiences, I think, like loss or addiction or suffering, persecution, rejection, infection. Those are the dark valleys that we experience in life. It's in those moments where we can feel the most alone. Now, I want you to notice when you read through, excuse me, read through this, that it changes, the pronoun changes from, uh, from looking at God to you, to the first, uh, <laughs> the, the, to the Lord is my shepherd, to the second person, you. <clears throat> There's a change, a shift here. He's talking directly to the Lord as if he was right there with him. He says, you are with me. And that's kind of the key phrase out of this whole psalm, Psalms 23. The whole point is that God's with me in the green pastures and he's with me in the dark valleys. He's with me in the good parts of life and he's with me with the tough parts of life. The key is that he is with me. It's, impar it's a comparison between something uh, terrifying and something that gives us peace. So we're not promised to go through life stress-free or pain-free. However, God does promise us that he will go with us no matter where we go and what and circumstance that we end up with. Now they said the shepherd had a rod and a staff. A rod they placed in their belt and they would pull it off to fight off animals or robbers. And the, and the staff was a tall staff. Some of them have hooks on it so that they can grab the sheep out of the water, that they can herd them a little bit, and they can use it for a weapon as well. The image is of protection. Not only God would be with us through the dark valleys, but he will protect us through the dark valleys. 
The point being that we don't have to fear with our Lord as our shepherd. And even when we go through those dark days, and we will go through these dark days, those dark days, um, he will be right beside us. He will protect us. He will help us make the right decision. He will give us the peace in the midst of tragedy. He will give us the courage that we need to move forward and to face evil. Now, some translate this word comfort there at the end where it says, thy staff will comfort me. They translate it. They say it's not, it's not, a, it's not the best word. It doesn't capture the essence that it gives me courage. That's the point of it. That because of God's presence, it gives me courage. And there's that, ten, um, that um, energy there that you can push forward because you know that God is behind you. Uh, I know that when I was in, <laughs> had my tonsils out uh, as a little boy, I can't remember how old I was, five or six years old, and I remember that I had to have a shot. And so I was scared to death of that. still don't like them very much. And I just remember very vividly in my mind, they're coming in and they're, you know, I'm sure the needle was about that long. I swear it was that long. And I started to cry, but my, my dad said that he would, my dad was there with me. And uh, they poked it in. And right when they poked it in, my dad says, ouch, and it scared me. And I started to laugh. And all of a sudden that fear ran away. That wasn't there any longer. There was something about having my dad present in my room that drove that fear away. And that's what God's talking about here. He is with us no matter what we go through. And so it can drive that fear away and it will give us courage to face whatever it is that we face. <clears throat> Number five, I will not lack for provision. In verse five, it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Well, it seems like there's a change of scenery here from a, a hilltop as a shepherd and now we're going into a home. And uh, and there's no more talk of sheep any longer, but most scholars want to keep these sections together. It really is an important image of friendship. <clears throat> Someone said that if you had have somebody over your house, they would be gracious hosts. <clears throat> they would make sure to protect you at all costs. So the neat thing here is that the Lord is our host. He's the one that's putting on the party for us. It says, a table in the presence of my enemies. What that means is that your enemies have been defeated. There's no more fear. In fact, they're, they're on the outside looking in, seeing what you have. It's not one of pride and kind of thumbing your nose at them. It just, it, it's one of safety, that they can't touch you any longer. And this, this banquet that we're having is one of safety and provision. God's love is like that. There's nothing that will take that away from us. Uh, this idea of anointing the head in my oil. Now, if I did that, my, my head would shine. <laughs> Sometimes I put, if I get a little dry scalp, I'll put a little baby oil, baby oil, yes, baby oil, on my head to make it uh, soft and, and, uh, <laughs> and glide. I can run a lot faster when I do that too. The wind just goes right off the top of my head. But they would take oil uh, when you had a guest come over and it was refreshing. It kind of made you feel better. Um, it made you smell better. Uh, but it was really a, a, in honor of your guests. You wanted to make sure that they were taken care of very, very well. So that image there is God's hosting this party for us and he's going to take care of us and he's going to provide for us. I love that image. Isn't that great? Nothing can be taken away when God provides. And it's those things that we ultimately lead, like forgiveness and love and value and purpose and mission, all those things that give us meaning in life. That's what God will provide. There was a man that I grew up, uh, my aunt and uncle lived right off of Highway 75 out in western Minnesota. They grew up, they were living on a farm. And once in a while they'd have some hitchhikers. This is back in the 60s and the 70s. And sometimes hippies and, and just people traveling the country uh, would start hitchhiking across the country. And one in particular we remember because he was, became part of our family. His name is Philip. He's a big man, probably a special needs guy, a little... Uh, uh, just, you could tell that there's, he had some kind of disability. He would ride his bike. He was a big guy and that bike would go. He did, I bet you, thousands of miles on a highway, hitchhiking back and forth. But he developed friendships along the way <clears throat> and people knew him and recognized him. And so we'd go over to, to lunch after Sunday church over to my aunt and uncle's house and my, uh, my aunt and my mom would get some food together. And then all of a sudden, Philip would show up and he'd come in and he was loud. Hey, everybody! He was kind of a loud guy, and, but a harmless guy. <clears throat> and... Um, but I was just fascinated by that. And he'd be sitting at the table eating and all of a sudden he'd get up and he goes, I need to go. And Betty and Meredith knew what was going on. They said, he just needs a little. The Lord's calling him to go. So he'd get up and go. And all of a sudden he'd walk out to the road and a car would stop and pick him up. It was almost like he had this sixth sense that some, somebody was going to help him. It was really God's purpose. He believed in the Lord and he believed that God provided for him in that way. Isn't that a, a simple faith? And that's what's promised here, that God will provide for us in a simple way. I will not lack encouragement. That's number six. 
Verse 6, verse 8. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and love are terms used to describe God's covenant relationship with his people. The word follow fails to capture the tenacity of how God distributes his goodness and his love. It was usually the enemy that was pursuing uh, the person in the Psalms, but here it's God's love and God's goodness that are pursuing the person. It's done in a tenacious way, in an energetic, it, it, it's just hard to capture. It's this relentless pursuit of us. Isn't that awesome? That God's goodness and love, he relentlessly pursues us. Even if we're far from him, he will relentlessly pursue us. Surely your goodness and love will relentlessly pursue me all the days of my life. That love will never go away. You can never do anything to separate yourself from God's love. Now, you might make the decision to separate from God's love, but God's love is always there, relentlessly pursuing you and his goodness. Our Lord deals with us graciously. His love is, is faithful and always be beside us, and that should encourage us, encourage us to keep going. Isn't that important that we relentlessly pursue people in love and goodness as well? Marianne Ortiz works out here in our campus. She's our, our uh, housing director, but she also mentors some of our, our women that are coming out of some tough situations. She has about 10 of them right now, which is too many, but that's uh, what we're doing, and that's what she's doing. She pours her life into them. She, she, uh, it's not the easiest job in the world. It can be very, very messy to try to keep these girls, their heads above water when they get stressed out. A lot of them coming out of addictive backgrounds, some of them abusive backgrounds. And um, every day, there's probably not a call that she doesn't make to make sure and check on, especially during this time of pandemic. She's doing a fantastic job of it, and she just loves those women so much. She is relentlessly pursuing them with love and goodness. We need more people to do that. We need more people to help us out here. We have men coming out here that need people to relentlessly love and pursue them with goodness and to mentor them. Why? Because that's what God does to us. That's how God treats us. And that's how we are to treat other people as well. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And lastly, number seven, I will not lack hope. The latter part of verse six, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Worshippers of God loved to go to the temple because they felt like that's where God was, and so they went to meet with God. But for God, this is simple because God's presence, when we make a decision to follow Jesus, his presence comes into our life via the Holy Spirit. So God dwells with us. It's a promise uh, that God gives all throughout the Bible. I will be with you. You'll be my people, and I will be God, and I will be with you. I will go with you to the promised land. That promise over and over and over again. And Jesus gave the same promise to his disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. And, I, and he says at the latter part of Matthew 28, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. God is with us and goes along with us. And that, that gives us hope. And not only does he dwell with us here, when things come to an end in this life, I think of Mary Norrie. She is in heaven today. She has no more pain. She can take a deep breath of air for the first time in a long time. And all that suffering is gone. And she's in the presence of the Lord. And that's the hope that she had. And that's the hope that we can have as well. Even in the middle of this pandemic, I know that we fear it. And um, you think the older you get, you know, when you go 50s, you're at this rate. 60s, you're at this rate. 70s, 80s, you fear it. Um, and so it makes us anxious. But we don't have to as Christ followers. Why? Because we know that Jesus rose from the dead. And we know that he's conquered death. And no, we don't have to fear it. We don't have to fear it. There is hope. And if we do die, we get to go dwell with our Lord in heaven forever. If we don't die, we still hear God dwells with us to help us deal with life as well. That's what hope is about. You know, the Spanish flu in 1918 was terrible. It was estimated that 500 million people contacted that or contracted that. About 50 million died worldwide. 50 million. Go look at the numbers from COVID right now compared to the Spanish flu. 50 million people died, and the population was a lot less back then. That was a lot of people. About 675,000 people died in the United States. But did you know what? It ended. It took a couple years, but it ended. And this pandemic will end someday as well. And so we will stand up, and we will look at it and face it with courage because we have the hope that God, will do it, that God is with us through this pandemic. And even if it gets us, even if we succumb to it, that we will be with God in paradise forever. And so there's hope, people. There's hope. We can get through this 
we can get through this. And that's what we desperately hold on to. All right, here's the bottom line. David has painted a beautiful picture of a relationship with God. The key is that we recognize that we're dumb sheep (laughs) and we need a shepherd to guide us. Otherwise, we do crazy things. And look at those promises. The reason why that we can relax in the Lord is that we will not lack peace or second chances or guidance or courage or provision or encouragement or hope. Psalms 103 through 5, another psalm David wrote, it says, Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. And we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. So enter His courts with thanksgiving and His courts with praise and give thanks to Him and praise His name forever. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I love that because we are the sheep of his pasture. But notice there's confidence there. There's joy there because he's our shepherd. Know that the Lord is God and that he's good and that his love endures forever. Relax. Relax in the Lord. God's watching out for you and he's watching out for me. Relax. want to end our time together by sharing the Lord's Supper with each other. And I'll give you a moment to grab the things that you need in order to celebrate with us as we remember Jesus. It's interesting to note that in the New Testament, Jesus is described as our shepherd, the great shepherd that will guide and protect and provide for us throughout our life. In John 10, verse 11 through 16, Jesus uses it as a name for himself. He says, I am the good shepherd. This good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. And so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's the hired man and cares nothing about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just like the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold or this pen, and I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So that image of a caregiver, of somebody taking care of us, and Jesus says, even willing to lay down his life for us. That's what we celebrate for the Lord's Supper and through our communion time together, that Jesus laid down his life for us for us dumb sheep. We're not very smart, the things that we've done in our life. And the shepherd still lay down his life. Why? Because he loves us. God loves us. So let's celebrate the Lord's Supper together in that unbelievable love. Let's remember the body that he gave for us, that he laid down for us, so that he could offer as in uh, in our place, Instead of us being there, Jesus went there for us. And let's remember his blood that was shed, that was given as a sacrifice to make atonement for our sin so that we can be forgiven for all those dumb things that we've done in our life. It only comes because of our good shepherd that laid down his life for us. So let's take part together and thank Jesus for what he's done. The body of Christ. the blood of Christ. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, for your goodness and your grace as it is reflected as the great shepherd taking care of his flock. Forgive us for being dumb sheep, Lord, for doing all the crazy things that we've done in our life. But thank you for loving us and sticking with us and relentlessly pursuing us with your love and your goodness. And I pray that we don't take that for granted and that we can hold on to that that hope that you give to us as we endure life and as we go through the dark valleys of life. Thank you for Jesus, Lord. Thank you for our time together today that we can celebrate and that we can reflect. 
and that we can relax. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for listening. And before you leave, I wanted to give you a blessing from, uh, from the scriptures in Hebrews 13.10. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may, and my, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom the glory be forever and ever. Amen. Relax. The Good Shepherd is watching over us. Blessings, everybody.